Welcome to the third of our three-part installment on digital to analog conversion. In this lesson, we'll take a look at how to implement digital to analog converters. Some microcontrollers actually contain true DACs on board, such as the Arduino Due. The Arduino Uno microcontroller uses a pseudo analog output, and the analog write command controls that particular pulse width modulated output. Recall that a PWM signal looks something like a pulse train. So as we see here, a square wave with some duty cycle. Here I'm showing a roughly 25% duty cycle. I would implement this on my Arduino Uno with an analog write command where I send a pin number, comma, the level, right? So for an 8-bit pulse width modulated output, 64 would give me roughly a quarter. 64 divided by 256 would give me a one quarter or 25% duty cycle. So this digital output signal is going between five volts and zero volts. And in terms of the timing, the period will be somewhere on the order of two milliseconds. But this is clearly not an analog signal that we'd expect to get out of a digital to analog converter. This is a pulse width modulated digital signal. So the question is, how do we get this analog signal out? And the way we accomplish that is to send this pulse width modulated train through a low pass filter. At the input of the low pass filter is the PWM modulated voltage. I then measure the output voltage across the capacitor, and I get an approximate output voltage that's based on the duty cycle of my pulse width modulated input. Based on the selection of our resistor and capacitor, we can define a time constant tau that'll be equal to R times C, and a corner frequency of one over tau or one over RC. So based on the frequency of my pulse width modulated signal, I'll need to choose a resistor and capacitor such that I get a properly filtered version of the pulse width modulated signal. So the output of this low pass filter that'll be charging and discharging, and the level of that output will be related to the duty cycle of our pulse width modulated signal. So it'll be roughly a quarter of five volts or 1.25 volts. Now that capacitor is going to be charging and discharging each time, so the signal will have a fair amount of ripple. In order to minimize the ripple, I can either increase the time constant of my low pass filter, or I can increase the frequency of the pulse width modulated signal. Either way, I'm slowing down the corner frequency of my filter relative to the frequency of the PWM signal. The downside there is that as I increase the time constant, I also increase the settling time of my digital to analog converter. So as I change voltage levels, it's now going to take a longer time to settle at that particular output level. So let's say I'm at analog rate of 364 to begin with, and then I have a delay and then another analog write, and I take that pin up to 128, which should be a output of 2.5 volts, if I have a larger time constant, it's going to take a longer amount of time for my output to reach that 2.5 volt level. We can also create a DAC by using a summing amplifier. Here we have an output voltage and a resistor R in negative feedback, as well as two inputs here. And we'll call this one D0 times my full scale range voltage. And we'll call this one D1 times my full scale range voltage. D0 and D1 in this case, they're both going to be binary inputs. And so for both inputs, I can either have zero volts or the full scale range. Now this example is relatively straightforward for analytical purposes. We're using a two bit DAC here, um, but we could create larger bit DACs by adding more resistors and we'll multiply it by two each time. So here we would have R, here's two R, four R up to eight R. And for this four bit DAC, D0, my least significant bit term, will always be at the highest resistance. So I'll have D0, D1, D2, and up to D3, where the uh, Ds in orange here are for a four bit DAC and the D0, D1 in green would be for the two bit DAC. In this circuit, we have ground attached to our non-inverting input. Uh, so therefore we have a virtual ground attached to our inverting input. 
And from here, we can apply Kurtzkopf through the currents through the resistors. So here I have IRF, that's a current through the feedback resistor. IR is a current through this resistor. And I2R is the current through the 2R resistor. So if I look at the currents coming in and out of this node, I can apply Kurtzkopf such that IRF plus IR plus I2R is equal to zero. We can now define each of these currents. And before I do that, I'm going to make one change here. These VFSR terms, I'm going to call those VS for V supply in the interest of clarity. So if I expand upon my Kirchhoff statement, I'll end up with the following. And if I multiply through by 2R, I'll end up with a description of V out. So V out will be equal to minus 1 half times the quantity 2D1 plus D0 all times Vs. We could take a look at the output that we'll get based on our inputs, D0 and D1. So D1 and D0, they can be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. In the case where both inputs are zero, this term will be zero, and therefore my output voltage will be zero. In the case where D1 is zero and D0 is a one, I'll end up with minus Vs over two. In the case where D1 is one and D0 is a zero, I end up with a minus Vs. And when they're both equal to one, these terms sum up to three, three divided by two, so minus three Vs over two. Recall from before our generic description of the output voltage from a DAC. That was equal to the code divided by 2 to the m bits all times VFSR. So this will hold true if VFSR is equal to minus 2Vs for this circuit. So although the circuitry and the approach is a little more complicated for the summing amplifier, I get a nice steady output voltage as opposed to the uh, ripple output voltage that I get with the PWM approach. We'll also consider the R2R DAC, uh, which in comparison to the summing amplifier where we had resistances that were doubling in value each time. So these higher resistances, they can often be hard to locate uh, or identify or purchase. The R2R DAC only requires two types of resistors. So one at R and another at 2R. We'll start with the 2-bit DAC, and then we'll evaluate how to uh, expand our DAC for higher bit numbers. For this 2-bit R2R DAC, other than this resistor tied to ground, I have two R resistors connected to my digital inputs and an R resistor between them. And in this case, I have D0, that least significant bit term that's connected closest to ground. My D1 term times Vs is going through a 2R uh, connected to this node here, and I'm measuring my output voltage here. If I wanted to go from a 2-bit DAC up to a 4-bit DAC, it would take this form, where I would now have D2 and D3 as two additional digital inputs, both times Vs. Um, they both be connected through a 2R resistor with an R resistor between them, and I'd be measuring the output at this node in the case of the 4-bit DAC. Let's analyze the 2-bit case. So I'll define a voltage at this node VA, and I'll once again uh, apply Kirchhoff's current law, and I'll be evaluating these currents. So applying Kirchhoff's current law to this node, I end up with the following description. D1 times Vs minus V out all over 2R will be equal to V out minus VA all over R. So if I cross multiply and simplify, I end up with 3 times V out is equal to D1 Vs plus 2 times VA. So I need to come up with a description for VA. I can accomplish that with Kirchhoff once again and applying Kirchhoff to these currents. So I'll be looking at this node now to try and get a description of VA. So if I apply Kirchhoff, I end up with the following description. And once again, we can cross multiply and simplify. So we now have a description of VA and we can plug that back into our original equation. So ultimately, we end up with 3V out is equal to D1VS plus D0VS over 2 plus V out. This simplifies down to V out is equal to quantity D1 over 2 plus D0 over 4 all times Vs. And so this is the definition of my output voltage uh, for my 2-bit R2R DAC. Once again, let's take a look at the output voltage with respect to the state of the different inputs, D0 and D1. 
In the case where both of my inputs are zero, my output voltage will be zero. In the case where D1 is zero and D0 is one, I end up with a Vs over four. When D1 is one and D0 is a zero, I end up with Vs over two. And when they're both equal to one, I end up with three Vs over four. And once again, this matches up with the output that we were discussing earlier, where the output voltage is defined as the code divided by two to the m bits times VFSR. And in this case, VFSR is equal to Vs. And lastly, we'll go ahead and simulate our two bit R to R digital analog converter. Here we're using Circuit Lab. I've set up my circuit with a supply voltage of five volts. I have two switches to denote D0 and D1. D0 is my least significant bit. For a two bit, D1 would be my most significant bit. And I've chosen my resistors of 1K and 2K. So I have R and 2R. And I'll measure my V out here. If I go ahead and simulate this circuit, run my DC solver, I see that I'm expecting when both of my switches are open, I should have zero volts output. And lo and behold, I have zero volts output. Now let's go ahead and set D0 high and simulate. And we're expecting an output of Vs over four, which would be five over four or 1.25 volts. So that's good. Let's go ahead and set D0 low and set D1 high. And we're expecting an output of Vs over two, which should be 2.5 volts. Go ahead and solve that. And we have 2.5 volts on our output. And lastly, let's set both D0 and D1 high. And run, and we're expecting an output of three Vs over four. So if I run the solver, I see three times five over four is 3.75 volts. So we're able to simulate our two bit R2R digital analog converter using Circuit Lab uh, with nothing more than switches, resistors, uh, a voltage source, and a uh, voltmeter to measure the output.